Um, actually, if you want to go ahead and put the banner up, it's 9.03 a.m. Pacific, 12.03 p.m. on the East Coast. And today we're going to talk about stagflation. Uh, I talked about this last week and I said we'd go through this in a little bit more detail. Um, and uh, this is part one for stagflation. So you can go ahead and remove that. Now that we've captured that, uh, we can add that to our News You Can Use collection on YouTube. By the way, you guys can always go back and look at just the, the front ends of these calls uh, on YouTube. Uh, we clip them and, and stick them on there a couple, three times a week. Uh, stagflation is something that we've got going right now. Uh, this is the last time we had stagflation in this economy was in the early 1970s when Richard Nixon was the president. Um, and I'm, uh, the reason we're doing this is two parts because stagflation is high inflation and then stagnant output or growth or wage growth type things. So today we're going to cover the inflationary aspect. And then on Thursday night, we will cover the stagnant uh, output and, and the reasons for that. Uh, and we're going to dig in here a little deep and tell you how this is going to affect you guys in the housing business. First of all, home buyers, uh, home builders are not building enough homes and they haven't been for a long time. Uh, right now, the reason that they're not doing it uh, is persistent supply chain problems. So home prices nationwide last year went up 18.8%. This is across the board. Now, of course, there are some areas of the country that actually lost value. Think uh, San Francisco, for example, the closest city to me that actually literally um, houses sell for less today than they did a year ago uh, because of the situation with COVID and, and uh, some of the other problems that they've got managing that large but beautiful city. Um, Anyway, per the Case-Shiller Index, 18.8% nationwide, everybody is a group. But the supply chain uh, hasn't changed and has actually dropped in the last year. And by supply, uh, not the supply chain, but the number of houses available. So you hear this all the time on the mainstream media that we've got a housing shortage, that we're short someplace between four and six million houses nationwide for the demand. That's true. But in theory, we are always short of houses. There's always, if all things were being equal and everybody who didn't have to actually pay for a house could get a house if they wanted a house, then yes, we are theoretically short of the number of houses. The home builders have tended to manage that properly by anticipating you know, demand that can come through with an actual loan. Um, in other words, there could be demand for 4 million houses, but it may only 400,000 people be able to actually afford to get a new house. Now, one of the things that has exacerbated this in the last year or two is the coming of age of millennials. So millennials, the average age is now 30 years old, and that's the average age in the U.S. historically in which people will buy their first house. So we've got this huge demographic of millennials uh, who, in theory, want to own a home. Now, do they want to? Yes. But, you know, these folks have lived, and, and the reason I, I can have some expertise on this is my oldest son is 30, um, and he uh, lives in San Diego and has lived in a, in a condo for six years or seven years, has a great job, makes a lot of money, saves a lot of money, could afford a house, but they like that urban lifestyle. You know, do they want a house? Yes. Would they be part of that 4 million people in theory, who would like to get a house but can't afford it uh, or can't find a house. Actually, he can afford it, but he can't find something that's priced reasonable. Yes. Uh, but he's OK living, you know, in downtown San Diego and, you know, hitting all the, the things that 30 year olds did. Um, but anyway, um, there's two ways to address this supply chain shortage. Uh, first of all, is to increase the supply of prop of the items of the actual supply chain itself that we're short on. So in the housing business, we can't get garage doors, cabinets, windows. These things are holding back new home builds. If you guys have done any remodeling lately, you'll find that it's very hard to find those things. Um, and the government can't fix that problem. The government can't mandate, hey, we require more garage doors. We require more window manufacturing, that kind of thing. It's, they can't do that. Uh, the second way that we can address this supply issue of a shortage of houses is to raise interest rates. And But what that does is it chokes off the home buying demand. 
In other words, when rates get so high, the payment, the monthly payment that people will be paying will be too much and they won't be able to afford a house. So that's one way of, and the government has historically tempered this by doing that. So they've raised rates. And for example, six months ago, you could get a, a government backed FHA loan for 2.6%. Today, it's about 3.8. That's a 50% increase, essentially. So if you were, if you got a home loan a year ago or six months ago and you paid $2,000 a month, today it would cost you three. And a lot of people, that difference between two and three is the difference between staying in the rental house or apartment they're in and buying a new home. So that has effectively uh, chopped demand fairly dramatically. Uh, but, but here's the rub. Um, if there is not enough housing stock to satisfy demand so that a rate of interest rates, uh, a bump in interest rates will actually throw off the economy, the rest of the economy, and literally could throw the rest of the economy into a recession. And it can get so bad, it can, it can come to the point where Nixon had to step in as a federal government, I think it was in 1971 or 72, and he did several things. He devalued the dollar. We can't afford to do that nationwide or even globally because if we devalue the dollar, it's going to cost us more money to pay our interest to the people who bought our T-bills, T-bonds, and that type of thing. And if that happens, the country goes broke. We can't print money ad infinitum. That's a whole other show we'll talk about at some point in time. But the devaluation of the dollar is really not something that would be on the plate in today's day and age. Now, in 1971, you know, our borrowing was very minimal. We didn't, we weren't in hock to the Chinese for trillions of dollars like we are today. So that one's off the table. The other thing that he did was he declared wage and price freezes. I think that this may happen. I think that you may see this thing if the, the price increases that the Fed is projecting don't work. And the first one is scheduled tomorrow. Uh, they're expecting a quarter point increase in the Fed rate. And they're expecting you know as many as five this year total. But if those don't work, you may see the president step in and freeze prices because that is the ultimate break the glass plan for keeping inflation in check. If he makes it illegal to raise your prices on anything, that would stop inflation. It's actually fairly effective. Um, there's a whole bunch of downstream issues and problems with that, but it would uh, certainly, uh, you know, knock everybody off. Uh, off, it would reset everything at this point. Um, Okay, at the, at the peak of the housing bubble, now think back to the recessionary period of 2008, 9, 10, the housing crisis, as they call it. Housing, the housing market was the most fragile piece of the economy. Today, it's the other way around. The housing piece is the strongest piece of our national economy. And as such, it's in the government's best interest to really protect it. So they've got themselves between a rock and a hard place. They've got to get this inflation under control, which is actually a supply chain issue, I would argue, instead of pure inflationary issues. Uh, and the way to look at it is like this. If there is a limited amount of supply of any goods or services, um, who's gonna be the buyer of those? Well, it's gonna be the people who can pay the most amount of money for it, right? That's what creates an artificial inflationary environment. So. Who gets the supplies? The people have money. The rich people get the stuff and people who are not as fortunate financially don't get the stuff. Uh, and the stuff would also include the, the housing stock that's available out there. Now, keep in mind, house prices uh, and interest rates do not factor into the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. And that's the thing that they use to gauge whether inflation is going up or down, the CPI. But what does go in there that's housing related is uh, rental rates, you know, the amounts that people pay to rent a property. So if we choke off demand to buy houses by raising interest rates too high, it will create more of a demand for a rental property. And once again, you have a small number of rental properties compared to the big demand 
So rental rates go up. We've seen that happen for the last year or so. And they're going to, I believe they're going to continue to go up. So in this industry, owning a rental is probably not a bad thing, especially if you use something like a lease option strategy that we teach in transactional engineering uh, to help you. Um, so anyway, that's, that's kind of it for inflation. They're, the government is between a rock and a hard place. I, I would potentially project that if uh, down the road, if these first two increases, the one now and the one in, I think, May, uh, if they don't cool off this heating economy and allow us to get more supply into the system, expect the president to step in if he's capable and able and do some kind of a wage slash price freeze on everything. Uh, it, probably not a bad idea. I know it's a drastic draconian type measure. Uh, I, I'm, and I'm typically I'm more free market oriented, but I might support it because here in California, uh, this last weekend in, in Southern California, gas was $6.99 a gallon at some stores. I haven't seen it go over seven yet, but we're close. And, you know, people cannot afford to drive like they used to. I mean, it was a noticeable difference uh, on the freeway system in the last even week. Uh, for people, it's almost eerie like COVID is starting again because people just can't get out there and drive. Um, it's, it's crazy. So I would expect you'll see something like that uh, happen if this increase in Fed rate doesn't help. And I don't think that it will. So that is news you can use for today, stagflation part one. Come back Thursday at 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern. And we'll talk about part two, which is the supply chain problems and what's really behind those. All right.